Hey guys, welcome back to For I Have Sinned. My name is Jess. And this is Lauren. And we're back with a 15-minute murder. It's number 10. Yes. Uh, We haven't done one in a while. I don't even remember the last time we did one. I think it was like September, actually. (laughs) It's been a minute. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, um, before we start, uh, just a quick shout-out to James. He is our newest patron. Thank you so much for patronizing us. No. (laughs) (laughs) the good way not in the bad way (laughs) (laughs) and yes so uh we look forward to hopefully getting some more patrons uh thank you again james you're awesome thanks for subscribing thanks james yes so lauren you go first yes um so oh i just want to say look how pretty lauren looks she had just had a photo shoot Thank you. What a good day to record, too, huh? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not wearing a hoodie or a fucking <laughs> turban. <laughs> yes. I like your little, your little pigtails, too. Thanks. Thank my little, my, uh, my 10-year-old told me I look like a three-year-old, but whatever. That's a compliment, so thanks, Matt. I, that's what I said. I said thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, this one's not quite as recent. I'm actually straying from, from my oh, usual. Awesome. Yes. Uh, but I wanted to cover the Covina massacre, which happened on Christmas Eve in Covina, uh, which is outside of Los Angeles, California. And it was Christmas Eve, 2008. I feel like I just read something about this. Really? I'm, I'm not a hundred percent. I don't know. I definitely have heard of it, but I feel like recently... I read some, whatever, just go. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's okay. So um, it was nine people that were killed either by gunshot wounds or arson, which he had a homemade (gasps) flamethrower. I did just hear, I did just, I listened to something about this. Okay. This is crazy. Yes. Like just the other day. This is a crazy, crazy case, but I'm excited to hear about it again, so. Yeah, yeah, it is. I didn't have a whole lot written, um, but it's just, it's fucking weird. It's really weird, and I can't imagine how horrifying it was. Um, So there was a Christmas Eve party being held, and this guy, who is 45-year-old Bruce Jeffrey Pardo, um, busts into the house wearing a Santa suit, and he just starts killing people. Um, he uh, so they think that the motive might have been marital problems. Uh, his divorce had been finalized on December eighteenth, so a week before he killed all of these people. And um, I guess it was his ex-wife and his former in-laws were some of the victims. It was approximately eleven thirty p.m. He knocks on the door of his former in-law's house, which there was, they say about 25 to 30 people were at this um, Christmas party. He had a wrapped gift, and in the wrapped gift box was a homemade flamethrower and two uh, 9mm pistols. And he also had two other nine millimeter pistols on his person. And now in California, it's really, really hard to even get pistols. So it's kind of interesting that he just happened to have four of them. Um, (laughs) And so it was like they open the door. He comes in. He pulls out the two handguns that he had on his person. And the first person he shot was his eight year old niece, Katrina, um, who, Oh wait, can I say something real quick? Yeah. One, there is actually something I know about that. Yeah. So she runs to the door and she looks out the window and she sees Santa Claus. So she yells, Santa, she opens the door. He picks her up like ho, ho, ho type thing, which is just absolutely Oh, it, yep. it, mm, yep. it kills so she, me. And that's exactly what I was just going to say. She was running to greet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. No, I, I didn't know that, that, um, part of it. So yeah, really fucked up. She thinks it's Santa and yeah, he shoots her. Um, and then apparently like the other victims, he just was just shooting people. He was just 
they, they said it was in indiscriminately. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they, they think that he might have killed some of them like point blank execution style. Uh, and then after he, I guess, was done shooting people, he went and grabbed the flamethrower and he used um, racing fuel. So like high octane racing fuel to set the house on fire. So um, 10 dead, including himself, and then three injured from from this whole thing. He it, it's just crazy. He shot a 16 year old girl in the back a 20 year old woman also suffered a broken ankle jumping out of the second floor window um and because the fire was so bad the victims that obviously didn't make it out or were killed had to be identified by their dental records oh god yeah Yeah. wasn't he like um like a scientist or an engineer or something like that like he he was engineer He, he was an electrical engineer okay yep Oh, okay, yeah. Because yep. I mean, to to build a homemade, what was it, flamethrower? Flamethrower, yeah. It's pretty, yeah. pretty impressive. So yeah, like right. not denying he was obviously a smart guy, but like, yeah, it's it's just sad because he probably was super smart and he just fucking snapped and um, yeah. he had he had no criminal record. He had no history of violence, but he was fired from his job uh, a couple of months, you know, like six months prior. And then he also uh, about six months prior was uh, in divorce court. They, he had to pay like almost $1,800 a month to his wife. So it was kind he kind of had really nothing else like I, I it's almost seems like he felt like he had nothing else yeah and he just lost his shit and he yeah he just flipped out and then um after like he was done setting this house on fire he changed his clothes out of his santa suit and got into a rental car and drove to his brother's house which was uh, about 30 miles away and they actually found him outside like in the car outside of his brother's house because his brother wasn't home uh and he died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound so he Mm -hmm. killed himself like a coward yeah so um also i from what i read or listened to i can't remember if i read something about it or if i listened to it but uh wasn't he like very badly burned like around yep. his torso or something like that yep and yeah so so they that think probably that he had a lot to do with to flee. oh i'm sure yeah they they actually uh believe that he might have wanted to flee uh, to another state. They were thinking possibly Canada was one theory and he had those third degree burns and he decided uh, not to do that, obviously, because he's got third degree gr- third degree burns. And it said that like some of the fucking Santa suit had melted into his skin. Yes. Oh, yeah. God. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know what? He fucking deserves worse yeah. than that. Or deserved Shit. worse than that. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Such an, ugh. Yep, yep. And when the cops found him, they found uh, $17,000 in cash stuck to his legs, like strapped to his legs. So uh, they're thinking he probably wanted to hide all that cash while he was escaping on the plane. Oh, wow. uh Uh-huh. They found money uh, on his person. And then they found... um, that the car was rigged with black powder so that if like his body was moved, they, they were thinking that it was like possibly going to detonate the car and the car would explode. Um, and then they found a bunch more, uh, magazines loaded with ammunition. They found at least 200 more rounds of ammunition at his house they said it looked like it, it was virtually a bomb factory in his home. And they found a shotgun at the house that he didn't bring with him. They found five empty boxes for handguns that he must have recently purchased and only ha- had found the four handguns. So it's interesting that maybe he had another one stashed away somewhere 
And then they found the high octane uh, fuel tank for, for the gasoline that he used to light the house on fire. So it's kind of fucking terrifying. This wow. was definitely, definitely planned out well in advance. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that about the, um, the cash strapped yeah. to his leg. Oh my God. I mean, yeah. Which kind of makes me think he didn't want his ex-wife to get any of his money. Right. And right. that's why he fucking just took her out and then took everything and planned on running. But yeah, it's kind of hard to run when you have a Santa suit melted into your flesh. <laughs> um, the little girl that answered the door, didn't she survive? Like her and her mom survived or something like that? So there, yes. And it's kind of, I wasn't able to find anything really about the survivors because they don't talk about it. Okay. From, from what I read, I wasn't able to find anything like there. It's known. So there's, there is this one really good article that was written by the LA times. Uh, and I wanted to kind of use some of the information from it, but it was so well written. I was like, mm, I almost feel like I should just read it because it was really so well yeah. written from the point of view of the people that were in there, even though nobody's really come forward other than basically what's known by investigators. I don't think anybody has come forward and done like interviews or spoken publicly about it. Oh, yeah. Um, but I mean, article, that's just got to be so terrifying. I, I mean, can't imagine the majority of your family's wiped out, like, you know, or, you know, whoever was there in your family, that's, just, oh my gosh, I cannot imagine. Yeah. On Christmas Eve too. So it's now, yeah. you know, every year, not only do you have to think about that, but your holidays are completely ruined forever. Like it's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh it's, my God. I know. Um, did you want me to read? It's not a super long thing that was written about the, the party. I could read yeah. just read it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so this was written by Hector Becerra and Tammy Abdullah uh, for the Los Angeles Times. Um, and it was published December 31st, 2008. So it was recently after this event had happened. In the dining room of their Covina home, Joseph, Papa Joe Ortega, and his wife of 53 years and their children had been playing a late night game of Texas Hold'em after Christmas Eve dinner. Their grandchildren played video games and hung out near the backyard pool. On the second floor, the Ortega's 17-year-old grandson, Michael, pecked away at a computer. There was a knock on the front door and the squeal of an eight-year-old girl happily crying, Santa Claus, Santa Claus. Seconds later, the girl was shot in the face by a man dressed as Santa Claus, and two of her uncles also fell to the ground wounded. The Ortegas and three of their daughters, including the gunman's ex-wife, dived under the dining room table for cover, but it was of no use. The Ortegas, four of their children, two daughters-in-law, and the teenager at the computer would all die at the hands of Bruce Jeffrey Pardo. The account is gleaned from relatives in the U.S. and Mexico who have been in contact with loved ones who survived the Christmas Eve rampage. So I guess that's how they got the information, just through other people, kind of. But none of the survivors themselves have actually talked about it. Yeah. I mean, I don't blame them. I don't either. Um, the survivors among the 25 to 30 people celebrating Christmas Eve with the Ortegas have not spoken publicly, but law enforcement sources close to the investigation confirm many of the relatives' descriptions, providing the clearest picture yet of what happened inside the house. The relatives paint a horrific scene of a gunman bent on carrying out executions and relatives struggling not only to escape, but to save their loved ones amid the panic. When Pardo arrived at the party, many of the adults were at the front of the house because people were beginning to leave, making them especially vulnerable in the attack, sources say. According to relatives, one of the Ortega sons, Charles, recognized Pardo after the gunman shot his eight-year-old niece and his older brother, James. It's Bruce, at least one person reportedly cried. Charles Ortega was shot after his brother, James, was hit. Irma Chapa Ortega, a first cousin to the adult Ortega children who lives in Torreon, Mexico, said James and Charles Ortega struggled to get up even after they were wounded. So that just goes to show you like they had that rush of adrenaline and even though they were shot and, and probably about to die, they still tried to get up and save their family. Yeah. And that's what, what it says. Even bloodied, they got up, they stood up, they tried to grab him to stop him, but they couldn't. The elder Ortegas, Joseph, 80, and Alicia, 70, 
and their three daughters slipped under the dining room table along with at least one daughter-in-law, Teresa Chapel Ortega said. She said she has been in contact with some of the survivors. Someone screamed, run, run. The Ortegas may have been killed while in the dining room along with two of their daughters, Sylvia and Alicia. The only... The only one of their children to survive was Letitia, the mother of the wounded eight-year-old girl, who, according to a 911 tape, had briefly hidden under the table. I heard the shots, Letitia told the police dispatcher in the 911 call. Everyone started panicking and running, and we all dove under the dining room table. Chapa Ortega said her cousin Letitia made a break for it, seeing her wounded daughter stagger out of the house. A source close to the investigation said that although Pardo had shot her in the face, the child may have saved herself by turning her head at the last moment. The bullet struck her alongside oh, wow. of her jaw. Uh-huh, it's kind of crazy, uh, said the source who spoke on condition of an anonymity because the case is still open. So at that point, it was still open. Relatives and the source said it was possible that Pardo had lifted the girl before shooting her, like what you said. Yeah. I need someone to come over and help my daughter, Letitia screamed at the dispatcher. She's bleeding. She's been shot in the side of her face. Some of the adults grabbed the children and carried them out. Investigators believe that almost all of the younger people were saved because they were in the back of the house closer to the television, possibly playing video games when Pardo opened fire. Although the eight-year-old was wounded, as was a 16-year-old girl who was shot in the back, the only minor killed in the attack was Michael Ortiz, the 17-year-old who was sitting at the computer on the second floor. Chapa Ortega said Michael was apparently killed by the explosion or fire started by the two tanks that Pardo had fused together to create a device quickly capable of engulfing the home in fire. Which is really sad. Like, he probably might not have even known what was going on if he was upstairs. Yeah. Just, you yeah. know, fuck, especially if you had like a headset on or whatever. It's just really sad and terrifying. Yeah. A law enforcement source said it appears that Michael was killed as a result of the fire or explosion and was not shot. Michael Ortiz's mother, Alicia Ortiz, the daughter of Joseph and Alicia Ortega, was also killed. Pardo, whose murderous rampage was apparently triggered by the divorce from the Ortega's daughter, Sylvia, had planned to escape and bought a plane ticket. This is saying to Illinois, but initially it was thought he was trying to go going to try to go to Canada. Mm. Um, but he was badly burned in the ex explosion and fire with second and third degree burns on his arms. So basically this just says he, you know, he drove to his brother's home, committed suicide. Um, he wanted to kill everyone, even his own mom, Chapa Ortega said on Tuesday. A monster. This man was a monster. He killed good, hardworking people who had many friends and who loved the United States. Oh. Yep. Terrible. Pretty, yep. Pretty sad. Yeah. Wow. I know. I just, I, the, oh God, the surviving members of that family, it's just like, no. you know. And survivor's guilt is such a real thing, too. Yeah, yeah. It mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Can't imagine. Yeah, fuck that dude. Yeah. Fuck him up the ass. Um, all right, well, I am covering the Hello Kitty murder. Have you ever heard Ooh, of that? No. <laughs> so, in May of 1999, a 14-year-old girl walks into a Hong Kong police department. She tells officers that she's being haunted by the ghost of a woman who had been bound by electrical wire and tortured to death. Police obviously like laughed it off and dismissed her claims as juvenile. And then the girl revealed that the ghost was of a woman that she helped murder. Oh, yeah. So, so <laughs> there's that. <laughs> there's that. Actually, the ghost is somebody that I killed. Um, yeah. So, so the police went with the girl to an apartment in the rundown Kowloon district where they discovered that the girl was not lying to them, sort of. She was obviously having nightmares, not being haunted. The police found an oversized Hello Kitty doll with a decapitated skull of a woman inside. Whoa. Yeah. Enter Fan Man Yi. 
I, I always pick these ones with like the crazy names. <laughs> like, not that it's crazy, but it's just like hard to pronounce. No. Yeah. Uh, as a child, she was abandoned by her family and she was raised in a girl's orphanage. As a teenager, she developed a drug habit and, tur and turned to sex work to support her ad addiction. By 23 years old, she got a job as a nightclub hostess, and she was still using drugs pretty regularly. In 1997, Fan met Chan Man Locke, a 34-year-old socialite. She met him at the nightclub she worked at. Chan Man Locke was a pimp and drug dealer, and before oh. long, yeah, before long, Fan began working for him. In late 1997, Fan became desperate for money and drugs and made the mistake that would ultimately cost her her life. She stole Manlock's wallet and tried to leave with the $4,000 inside of it. Oh. Yeah. Who has $14,000 in, in cash in their wallet? It's I guess usual. like, yeah, that's, that's normal. Uh, so when Manlock saw that his money was missing, he enlisted two of his henchmen. Okay. These, these are kind of hard names. Leong Xing Cho and Leong Wai Lun to kidnap Fan. He intended to take all of the money she was making through her sex work as payback, but things soon got out of hand. Mm. So Manlock and his henchmen began torturing her. They tied her up and beat her for over a month, where she was subjected to various harders, harders, horrors, wow, <laughs> such, as, such as they would burn her skin, rape her repeatedly, and they would force her to eat human feces. Ugh. You know, this actually, when I was reading, I've heard of this one, but when I was really looking into this, it reminds me of Junko Furuta in a way. Yep, I was just thinking that. Yeah. Um, so the 14-year-old girl who reported the murder to police, only known as Ah Fang, like for protection, I guess, because she was a minor. Okay. Uh, she, she was a girlfriend of Man Locks, um, which is gross. <laughs> Uh, ah Fang claims that she witnessed Manlock kick Fan 50 times in the head and she joined in, but she punched, she was punching her. Ugh. Oh yeah. wait, girlfriend, like romantic, not like Well, a... it, most likely she was probably a sex worker for him. Okay. But okay. She, I don't know. I guess maybe they had a sexual relationship. Ugh. Which and she's a less, minor. Yeah. She's 14 yeah. and he Ugh. was, uh, 34. Ugh. Yeah, 34. Oh, yeah. Disgusting. Um, so not all of the details of uh, the torture Ah Fang participated in were released because as part of her plea deal, um, it was because, oh, wow. Well, as part of her plea deal, they were not all released, the details. Um, but when when asked about her participation, she said, I had a feeling it was for fun. Oh, yeah. And still so, did it. Yeah. So I guess her idea of fun is very different than most people's. But yeah. yeah. So after being tortured for a month, Fan had died. And Manlock and his henchmen argued that she died from an overdose of meth, though it was most likely her injuries that eventually killed her. Yeah. Manlock's henchmen moved Fan's body to the bathtub where they dismembered her with a saw. Then they cooked the individual pieces of her body to stop decomposition. After cooking pieces of her body in boiling water, they disposed of them in the garbage disposal. Oh, God. Yeah. They saved her head, though. They boiled it and sewed it into an oversized Hello Kitty mermaid doll. They also kept one of Fan's teeth and several internal organs, which they stored in a plastic bag. So, like, trophies, I guess. I was going to say, were they going to eat it? I mean, well, I guess not, because they just wanted to stop decomposition. And uh, apparently they were, you know using utensils and stuff like that that they would later eat with and ugh, it's just what the fuck yeah um during the trial in exchange for protection afong testified against the three men 
Uh, and due to the state of fans remaining body parts, police and medical examiners could not determine a cause of death. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. As a result, the three men were not convicted of murder, but were convicted of manslaughter, as the jury believed death was not the intent. Just, like, don't even get me started on that. Like, you have body parts. You know? (laughs) (laughs) I'm at a loss of words right now. Exactly. So they just got charged with manslaughter. They didn't get charged with, like, tampering with evidence, um, abuse of a dead body, like... Apparently not. I mean, as far as what I've read, yeah. I know. Holy shit. Yeah. They were sentenced to life in prison, but they did have the possibility... They do have the possibility of parole in 20 years. And when did this happen? Uh, this was in 97, let me double check. No, 99. 99. May of 1999. So they could be out by now. I'm not, I didn't see anything about yeah. that. Oh, but my. it's possible that maybe the, um, his, his dudes are out. Um, the henchmen. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> even yeah. if that is. Even if the cause of death was a drug overdose, like, ultimately, right? they still tortured her for a month, had Raped her tied her, up, right, beat made her. her, right, made her eat human excrement, like, God. and then they, and then when she did die, they cut her up, got rid of, cooked her. her, yeah, got rid of a lot of her body parts, and then kept a few souvenirs. And I mean, I, I, I don't get where the whole sewing. The, the skull or the head. The head into a Hello Kitty doll. Like, I, I don't know how that idea oh, comes weird. to you. Yeah. But. Eh. That's not something that um, a normal person that didn't just murder somebody does. Like, that <laughs> yeah. just doesn't, doesn't, at least not. To my knowledge, it doesn't right. happen that way. And you know what? I mean, if they had brought her to the police, they could have, fe- or or informed the police. Yeah. Not that they would have, but if they if they did do something like that, they probably could have determined a cause of death. And right. yeah, they would have gotten charged with battery and and rape or something like that. Right. But I mean. <sighs> I mean, I honestly, in my opinion, I don't think she died of a meth overdose. No. I think that she died. I mean, how was she even able to, get, unless, they, I mean, maybe they? They could have been it. shooting her up or yeah. whatever. But yeah. even still, it almost, I almost feel like it's one of those situations where because it was somebody who was addict, addicted to drugs, was a sex worker, didn't have family, they probably just didn't give a fuck. Right, Honestly, exactly. we see exactly. it happens so often here. Yeah. I can and only how does assume. It go, right. And how does it go from, oh, well, you know what? For for payback, I'm just going to take all the money she makes now and not right. give her a cut. Right. And then how does it go from that to a, torture like, and murder? And, yeah. Yeah. Dismemberment. Yeah. Like, yeah. Holy and shit. This, this 14 year old, I mean, yeah, granted, she's a kid she's immature but how do you think that kicking somebody in the head 50 times and then joining in to to punch her to punch them how is that like just it was just for fun yeah just a normal tuesday like i mean i'm sorry i i will say that your you know your brain's not fully developed at that age you're not mm-hmm. mature for the most part most people but you know enough that that's not for fun. You know, I mean, this girl, maybe that girl, there's not a lot about her. Yeah. But maybe she grew up. I mean, obviously, if she was a sex worker at 14. Yeah. And, and maybe they threatened her and said, if you don't do yeah. it, we'll do the same to you or whatever. But it's just, it's just a fucking really sad situation all around. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the poor girl had. Uh, fan I'm talking about the poor girl had no chance from 
the jump. Like she was yeah. abandoned by her family. Yeah. Uh, she was put in an orphanage. She was then addicted to drugs. And I mean, the, the girl had no chance, yep. which is just the saddest part about it. Yeah, it is. It's really sad. Yeah. And I can't help but speculate that that's maybe a reason why they didn't really care about investigating into what actually happened yeah. to her. Honestly, that's that's they were like, yeah. oh, she doesn't have any known family. So, you know, it's just another drug addicted sex worker, you know, right. which and I've read stories where, I mean, you know, the cops will say, yeah, it's just another fucking crackhead hooker dead. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. yeah. Like the Anthony Soul case. That's why right, he was able exactly. to get away with it for so long. They were like, yeah, it's just another fucking crackhead hooker. Who right. Cares? And and also because it was women of color. And they were black. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Even more so. so. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And also, I mean, this is back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And even more so, you know, women, especially if they were sex workers and addicted to drugs, were not it wasn't taken seriously mm-hmm. and uh there's also, throwaways basically yeah right you and know? also asia where you know you have to be you know you have to you have to work hard and you have to be something and you know what i mean mm-hmm. very yeah. stri- strict way of living for yeah. the most part so mm-hmm. i mean i don't I, I i don't know if it's the same in every country in the continent but you know, like, I know Japan, they're very strict with their kids in school and uh, China, too. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's just, she just had everything against her. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. everything was going against her. Yep. So that was just absolutely terrible. And there are just some absolutely sick people in this world. Yeah. And it's kind of fucked up like that the the 14 year old girl was the one that kind of was like oh well I'm being haunted <laughs> like, yeah and that's yeah. how that's how and like nobody ever would have even known if she didn't come forward I wonder if she just said that to kind of segue into confessing mm. about this yeah I mean, I'm sure she was having, most likely having, like, nightmares about it or something. Yeah. But, again, I wonder if she just made up the haunting thing just to... Have an excuse. Have to something to there. say. Yeah. yeah. Have something to say and so she could confess, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I almost wonder also if she did finally confess to get her away from the other two guys because I'm sure they were not very nice to her like I'm sure that the yeah you know she yeah I mean again like I don't want to I don't want to blame her yeah she was probably scared too but again there's not there's not too much or high off her ass on drugs and didn't you know there's just so much yeah I could see so many different ways that this situation could have gone down absolutely yeah yeah Damn. and unfortunately there's not too many too many details concerning her the uh, the 14 year old because she was a she was a minor, a minor. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah so oh geez yeah it's pretty fucked up man i know um but on that note happy new year everybody happy new year <laughs> Happy year, enjoy some murder. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so please check out our Patreon. It's really cool. Yeah. Uh, if you're listening to this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch us talk about this stuff. Yeah. You can look at our pretty faces. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to do something, too. (laughs) That was good. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, uh, I hope everybody has a really good year. 2020 sucked. Not that, like, all of a sudden changing into 2021 is going to make everything magically disappear about 2020. But, you know, make some goals and 
it's, I you mean, know, start fresh. If you weren't, like, you weren't killed in a massacre or tortured to death. So that's a plus. Yeah, that is a plus. So that's start your 20, good. start your new year off right and yeah. think about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know what we always say? <laughs> <laughs> you know what we always say stay, stay safe, safe wash, wash your, your hands. hands please don't kill your family please. don't massacre people yeah don't kill people yeah don't don't kill anybody else's family <laughs> yeah um don't kill your ex-wife's family yeah don't um build a homemade flamethrower yeah with the intent of uh using it to massacre uh, an entire family Right. Maybe if you've got some stuff you need to burn. Sure. In your yard in a controlled burn. Sure. <laughs> I'll allow then, it. Then go ahead. Yeah. Go do it. You do it. Good for you. <laughs> uh, but otherwise. You. <laughs> please just don't. Yeah, just don't. Thanks. It's not good for anybody. Yeah. And then you'll get, you'll end up getting your Santa suit melted into your skin. So yeah. who's that good? Which also who's... sucks. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just nobody wins in this situation. Yeah, so yeah. it's a lose lose. So just don't. Just save yourself the hassle and just don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sitters. Thank you for listening or watching. And we will see you very soon or talk to you very soon. <laughs> Bye, sinners. Bye, sinners. <laughs>